I just tell myself right away, okay, this is going to hurt, but it's only going to last five minutes or 10 minutes. Like it's not forever. It's temporary. Like accepting that it's going to hurt and accepting that it's going to be hard. And then just like trying to stay calm in the pain. If I feel a lactic buildup very early in a long workout, I know I'm in trouble. So I will dial it back a lot. I'd say probably the competitive spirit is what makes me go faster if you want to nurse. I'm never going to feel ready to pick up a 135 pound thruster bar, right? So it helps to have a clock tell me when to do so. The fitness movement is brought to you by Zor Fitness. We offer coaching and individualized program design, as well as educational content for coaches and athletes. It's all at one place, zorfitness.com. So in this episode of the fitness movement, I've talked to a bunch of athletes and I've actually compiled a bunch of their answers and you'll hear those recordings shortly, but we're talking about coping mechanisms for exercise induced pain. Largely here we're talking about metabolic pain. So like going into a pain cave, so to speak, in a tough workout, how do you mentally frame and get ready for that? What are your coping mechanisms when you actually get into the workout? And when you reach that inflection point of leaning in versus backing off, how do you make that decision? What informs those decisions? Those sorts of questions. So after the athlete recordings, Day and Chris jump on and we talk about from our perspective as athletes, how we mentally frame that. And then also we have a little bit of discussion as the coaching side of things, how we try to get athletes to their best performance and mentally framing tough bouts of work. I think if it's something that I've already done, like a repeat or a benchmark, I just tell myself right away, okay, this is going to hurt, but it's only going to last five minutes or 10 minutes. Like it's not forever. It's temporary. And then I also like, while I'm, that's before. So when I'm like during the workout, I'm like, you're going to be just fine within five minutes of being done. It's going to be fine. You're going to be okay. Might feel a little sick, but you're going to be fine. Also, I've pushed three babies out of my vagina. <laughs> so <laughs> I can pretty much deal with a lot of pain. <laughs> yep. I mean, those are things that I think of. Yeah. Like, yeah, this is not, I've definitely experienced way worse pain than this. This is yeah. nothing. Mine is more recently since I started doing higher distance, like 65 miles. I know now that there's going to be highs and lows, like more intense highs where I feel good and the lows are going to be like low, like not where I feel like quitting, but where I'm like, this is more the mental part where the physical part is now like impacting my mental state where I'm like, I don't, I don't care anymore. I don't want to quit, but I just don't care because my knees hurt, my ankles hurt, my quads are locked up, and I can't move faster. My brain wants to, but I just can't. So at that point, I shorten my goals. Like I am making it to the next aid station, which might be at that point a mile away. And I'm putting my brain in a place where it's just one foot after the other, or it's literally just pick your legs up and run for 10 paces and then walk 10 paces. And then I'm able to get my legs going. Mm. So I think shortening my goals and knowing that I need to get my brain at least like a neutral place instead of like so low or so high helps me because like when I'm really high, like, oh my gosh, I'm really moving and I just ran 40 miles. Sometimes I do need to dial it back. Yeah. Um, but you know, you're probably not going to feel great in a little bit. Right. Like I, I struggled with conserving some of my running leg because I was like, I feel really good. I'm just going to move instead of like trying to maintain yeah. a good pace. But um, definitely talking to myself out loud. But in shorter stuff like CrossFit or even shorter distance running, I just turn my brain off and just just go. Yeah. 
like disassociate from my body. Yeah. I think that's relatable. I think like with longer workouts for us, I guess you would call them Murph like our marathon workout. Yeah. Like you think, okay, just get through two more rounds of it. Get, get through four more rounds of it. Get to round five, then get to round 10. And then just get to the run and just finish the run. Like I think we start to chunk things smaller. Like if I feel a lactic buildup very early in a long workout, I know I'm in trouble. So I will dial it back a lot. I was going to say, how do you not panic? I panic. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and I then, like if I start out a 5K really fast and I am like lactic right away, I know I messed up and I'm going to bonk. Yeah. But um, sometimes I expect it when I'm just coming back from something and starting like back on the short burst type of workouts, but, or even having a game plan. If your game plan doesn't work, not being too cut up about it. Well, yeah. And she, like choosing your attitude once you get to that point, it's like, okay, you feel like garbage right now, yeah. but this is what you chose to do. So this is what you want to be doing right now. Yeah. <laughs> you decided. Do you like frame it differently at all? If it's like a Murph type thing versus if it's like Fran? For sure. Yeah. I get way... So, like you said, like, you chunk it up a lot if it's, like, a Murph thing that's, like, longer where you, like, put it into little segments. Yeah. What do you do if it's, like, like, Fran or something where it's, like, a three-minute effort that's, like, really high and, like, super painful? Well, it's, like, I mean, for workouts like Fran, I've been, like, okay, it's not even one song. Like, it's yeah. literally a song on Spotify, and I'm going to be done. Yeah. Like, just go. You just got to, like... Not the Taylor Swift recent album. Mm. What? <laughs> all too well a 10 minute version okay but i just i try to relate it to things that are like in That's, the same time yeah. frame like it's it's such a short workout just just go like it's literally two three minutes of your life yeah during my 50ks and 100ks i only wear my headphones maybe like an hour out of that time so i am able to talk to myself out loud so i'm like all right, so yeah. it's time to pick up your feet, and yes, your legs hurt and it sucks, but you still have eight hours realistically out here. So guess what? Go. Yeah, because there are some workouts where you know you're not like you're not going to fail. It's just going to hurt really bad. Yeah, it's like Randy. You're not going to fail a fifty-five pound power snatch, but it's going to hurt know, really bad. Like it's, you just have to keep picking it up. I feel like for me personally, I tend to like to just like tell myself it's gonna be hard like rather than like i know some people are like oh this is easy and like i'm fit enough like personally i like to tell myself that it's gonna be really freaking hard and it's gonna hurt so bad like just like brace myself basically like same thing when i max like oh this is gonna feel super 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 heavy but i can do it it's like the same concept like i like to be like this is gonna hurt like hell but i can do it basically and then like trying to stay calm in that like accepting that it's gonna hurt and accepting that it's gonna be hard and then yeah, just like trying to stay calm in the pain, if that makes sense. Just like accepting it for what it is and then moving through it and telling myself I've done it a million times before, I can do it again. Um, and this is where you get better also. So yeah, hope that makes sense. Like I've done this weight for four reps before, so I can do a slightly heavier weight for three, or just like having my stats right now, really like, sometimes I like, look back at something like, oh, I think I did it that fast. And then it makes me like push harder whenever I do it again. Right, like, so you've done it before, so you know like how to pace it. Yeah, and yeah. Come back to it. And then you're also incentivized by trying to like beat yourself with like yeah. the competitive side of things. Yeah, I mean, I mostly try to beat, my, try to beat myself. I also when I'm running, I beat a little monster to myself because I tend to get really negative when I'm running. So I'm like, I'm really fast, you know, stupid things like that. To my tempo and my run. Gotcha. But then it helps you like keep your pace, basically. Yeah. yeah or just like take. Like, is it more to like distraction? Like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, I feel like I just like shut my brain off. Like I just want to go as fast as possible, get it over with. I say probably the like, competitive spirit is what makes me go faster. Than the way that I think about pain in the sport of fitness is, pain is a signal that I am approaching failure my heart or my other muscles are telling my brain that they are not receiving a sufficient level of oxygen to sustain a task. So when I registered the signal, I need to decide what I'm going to do with it.
pain means a failure point is approaching, but I need to be smart about how I track towards that failure point. I want to ensure I'm in an accurate level of pain for the task at hand. I think it's important to clarify that the goal in the sport of fitness should always be to move as fast as sustainably possible right up until failure. And there's a sort of spectrum of accurate failure from, on one hand, finishing a workout with my heart rate beating 75 beats per minute, feeling like I had more in the tank, versus, on the other hand, completely redlining and being unable to complete one more rep before the workout is over. If a workout has N number of reps, a perfectly executed workout for me would be failing the N plus one rep or passing out from metabolic distress one second after crossing the finish line. This would be truly optimizing my ability to manage and interpret my pain signals. And so to gauge this properly in practice, I need to familiarize myself with thresholds of pain across different movements to know what each pain signal means. If my quads start burning on a wall ball, how many reps do I have left before I'm going to miss the target? If my heart rate hits 185 beats per minute on the echo bike, how many seconds do I have left before I cramp up or fail to sustain my current power output? And it's important for me to know these thresholds so that when I experience those pain sensations, those pain signals in a test or com competition environment, I can adjust accordingly and put myself in the right amount of pain. I'm not afraid of pain because it's painful. I'm afraid of pain because it means failure is approaching and I can't fail because I want to win. So as I become familiar with these pain levels through training and I start experiencing pain in a Metcon, there are kind of two directions I can go when the pain sets in. One is to maintain or increase intensity and thus risk failure in that movement, right? Or two is to reduce intensity and thus risk underperforming to my abilities. And the way I think about in the moment which path to take is, is with higher risk of failure movements, say for example, ring muscle-ups, heavy snatches, even something like double-unders, I tend to be more conservative with my pain, right? If my heart is racing and my back is blown up, it's risky for me to attempt a heavy snatch before I feel ready. Whereas with lower risk of failure movements, for example, burpees or, or box jumps, I tend to be more aggressive with pain, right? I, I don't care if I just did double heavy chest to bar Fran and somebody just slapped me in the face, like I'm probably not going to fail a 24 inch box jump. Okay. So there is just never a point in slowing down my box jumps, regardless of the pain. And I think what's tricky is everyone knows the feeling of feeling yourself slipping off the bar on chest to bars and thinking, okay, this hurts. Do I keep going or do I break? And that is a very difficult question to determine which one leads to the best score on the workout. I don't care which one leads to the least pain. That's obvious. I care which one leads to my best score. Now, if a workout is testing pain tolerance, say a chipper, which ends with 34 facing burpees, you better believe I'm going to burpee my little heart out until I pass out. <laughs> And so I guess tactically, some strategies I have for managing pain and hedging against this failure, none of these are surprising or particularly innovative, but some of the ones I use are in a workout with multiple rounds, all aim for negative splits, looking at the clock, you know, between rounds and doing the math. On workouts with higher rep schemes, higher chunked reps, all aim for descending rep ladders. On workouts with ergs, all plan to use kind of benchmark wattages or paces based on my training tests. And then in high tension workouts with a lot of breaks built in, right? Say a Metcon or tester with a near maximal barbell or a high risk gymnastics movement, I will typically stare at the clock during a break to make sure I don't rest too long, right? Everyone knows that breaking a set of thrusters can easily be 30 plus seconds if you're not careful. Um, I'm never going to feel ready to pick up a 135 pound thruster bar, right? So it helps to have a clock tell me when to do so. And I think finally what I'll say is I feel like the sport of fitness gets a reputation as being a pain sport, but I think done correctly, it should really only be intensely painful for very brief periods of time at the ends of tests and in competition-like environments. 
you know, when I'm doing, say, 30 minutes of rowing intervals, I'm not worried about the pain. I'm worried about maximizing my calories per minute, about not slowing down. You know, give me all the pain in the world if it means I'm speeding up or I'm winning, right? (laughs) And when I'm in those moments at the ends of Metcons, in those final pushes, I just ask myself, do you want to win or not? Do you want to get stronger or not? And I just, I just don't let myself stop. Do you have a topic that you'd like to request as a future show or just a question about training? Reach out to me. My email is ben at zorfitness.com or you can DM me on Instagram at zorfitness. Lastly, head over to zorfitness.com if you want to browse all of our previous shows with in-depth show notes as well as educational content for all things training. So why don't we start with uh, just like your, your guys' personal experience. So like putting on your athlete hat rather than like your, your coaching hat for now. Uh, how do you like mentally get geared up, so to speak, if you're going into like a, a tough workout? So with my athlete hat on, right, when I was competing much more regularly, you know, I would sort of gear up like the, the, the mental prep would start sort of occur during the warm up. Uh, so if I was to frame it as like a qualifier workout, right? Anyone who's done a qualifier workout generally knows like those can be really like pretty crappy. Um, and that's the design, right? A lot of times. And so if I'm gearing up for one of those workouts, I'll start to mentally gear up during the warm up because I don't want to think too far ahead. Um, cause I think we all have had those clients or know those people that are thinking like about an open workout the night before and it's like keeping them up. And it's like, like, I, I, I can't do that. I don't want to do that because I, in the past have been the person who could fall into that trap. And then the next thing you know, you go into this hard workout, just feeling like drained already. So I'll kind of wait until the warm up, And then in the past, I would kind of like, depending on what the workout is, start to like really get geared up about like try to get excited to see what I can do. Um, and most of that was geared around the fact that like, I was generally better at those workouts than I would be at like a max lift or something like that. And so I almost felt more comfortable, like just destroying myself. So it's like, okay, this is a chance for me to get a lot of points. This is a chance for me to show off like the improvement I've made in certain areas. And so kind of gearing up for that excitement and just mentally knowing that like, yeah, this is going to get really, really uncomfortable. Um, and then mid workout, it, it's changed over time, right? I think at one point I had pretty negative self talk to push harder, like the whole like like why are you slowing down? Don't be so soft. Like keep going. Like those were like literal conversations I would have in my head. Um, and then over time, it became more positive as I learned more about being like growth mindset oriented about trying to positively encourage myself to get one more rep, just get back on the bar, manipulate where I could put my body to, to decrease the pain a little bit, you know, look for landmarks throughout the workout to be like, okay, if I can get to here, then I can get, take a break. Or if you get to here, you get to the next interval. Um, you know, those are kind of some of the different things I would do to approach like a really, really tough workout. Day, you want to take a stab at this? How do you like mentally frame and get prepared for those, uh, like tough workouts? Yeah, I think um, I'm someone, if anyone knows me well, they know that I'm a big overthinker. And that's what, like every. So, like schoolwork, like when I was in college, I would study excessively so that if there was something on the test that I, you know, that was kind of like a honest question, that, like, um, I was like super confident that I would get it. So, like reading the textbook. Um, so, that's kind of how I approach a lot of, a lot of workouts. I need to be very confident. So it, it all depends, like, if I have, like, let's say I'm doing a comp and I know a week's advance, what's coming up, right? The workouts are released early, then that that's usually when I perform my best because I can practice it, polish those skills up, um, kind of get, have a good strategy. And I go, deeper. like, once I'm confident, I'm, I know I got it, right? If it's something like the workouts aren't released until a few days before or something of that sort, um, that's where you'll see me where my heart rate goes up before doing any type of movement. It'll be like that. Right. Like I'm sweating, I'm faking, like you'll think I'm a politician for like, 
all jittery. Uh, and that's like a huge flaw, I think, that I've been trying to work at a lot. But I think one of the things is um, you'll always have time to strategize, whether it's a few weeks or a few minutes. So just having something there and like Chris mentioned, like having those milestones. I think that's one of the biggest things. So it's very easy to go out too hot or in the middle of a tough workout, thinking to yourself, oh my God, like I can't do this any longer. Looking at the clock and realizing there's still a few minutes left, like you felt like you've emptied the tank. So um, I think as time has gone on as well in doing hard workouts and kind of pushing that envelope here and there, you start realizing like, there's a lot of things you can do and there's always more left in the thing for the most part um so i think just over time those tough workouts it's kind of they've gotten easier just because it's gonna be grindy it'll be over in a few minutes it'll uh, be recovered be good to go after so um realizing that and you also learn like how far you can push too um so after after doing cross for a bit i kind of start to realize like where my limit is and i i know like how to approach that run. I would say preparation is the best. If I got a few weeks, it's awesome. Oh, just really practicing everything and getting all those skills hold it, um, owned it, everything. But um, I only got a few minutes. It's just a warm up area. That's where I have to strategize my head, go with it with at least some sort of plan. Yeah, no, I think that's super insightful. Um, yeah, both of your guys' responses are eerily similar to a lot of the things that the athletes said. And I feel like your experience as the person going through it it's probably different from other people like watching. And if, if I just answer for this for myself, I think like, yeah, like I'm sure like most people have been around CrossFit for a while. You start to like morph how you like think about it. And like, I'll at least speak for Chris and I, cause, uh, I know the formal sporting background that we had. Like we went, we wrestled on the same school for the same school in college. And it's like, I at least know what like that sort of, metabolic pain is like as well. And just like the conditioning side of that. Um, so like just having well over a decade of experience, like just like burying yourself in like the pain cave, like, like, Mm -hmm. like Dave mentioned, like, I think you do start to realize that like at a certain point, like there's going harder doesn't mean better. And like, Mm -hmm. in, in different types of workouts, that's going to mean different things. Obviously if it's like a, you know, eight minute workout of burpees and rowing, like that ceiling for, you know, that, that line where you cross it is like just really, really high. Like basically as as much pain as you're willing to tolerate, you can handle on a workout like that versus if it's like, you know, something that's got snatches up to 225 for, for me at 85, 90% of my one RM, it's like, okay, obviously I have to be completely different in how I attack that in terms of like the pain that I'm willing to tolerate because I just know where that line is. So but in terms of like getting geared up for like a, a rowing burpee pace piece where it is just going to be like incredibly metabolic and like no, no real bottleneck in something like that. I feel like in the the minutes leading up to, or like well beforehand, kind of like Chris mentioned, like I try not to dwell on it too much, like kind of keep like my mental space as relaxed as possible. As I actually go to approach it, I try to like, I, I know, and I like, allow myself to understand that it's going to be super hard and incredibly painful. But I also like in that I try to stay as calm as I possibly can. And then that also goes for like the first, you know, 80% of the workout or however long I can sustain being as calm and relaxed as possible. Like I I think about like trying to basically spread out the intensity that I have across the workout and knowing that where I actually experience that pain threshold is going to be different in different types of workouts. And being okay experiencing a little bit different than what I expect, but not too much different. Like if I expect to feel like trash in a burpee row, you know, at minute four, like halfway through that event, say it's an eight minute workout. And I feel like that at minute two, I will probably be concerned about that and like worried and anxious about that in the workout. (laughs) And if I don't feel that way by minute six, I also have that same feeling because it means I underpaced it. And if it's somewhere where it's like, you know, it's a minute off or so, like, I'm like, okay, this is about what I expected. Let's keep like lean into it and keep going. But either way you like reach at some point in a workout like that, like you find that like breaking point of like, you're either going to lean into the pain and like, 
not necessarily pick up your pace, but like, again, sort of like mentally lean into the discomfort versus there's other times where like, if you're not mentally geared up for that and the workout starts to hurt really bad, I'll back off that pace because I'm not willing to hurt that bad. Um, and where that is on varies day to day and like what the workout is, like what the scenario is, if it's competitive or not, et cetera. But yeah, I just try to stay as relaxed and as calm as possible until the point where like there's that breaking point and then it's like, all right, here we go. And I think a lot of that from both a physical and mental standpoint, and I bet I know we've had extensive conversations, uh, but I'm sure today you're in the same boat here. It's like, oh, I always felt like, So, so like part of my, as Ben knows, part of my like coaching certification process comes from like the OPEX level one, right? And so that framed a lot of things that I learned. And over time, like they're, in my opinion, they're like over here. A lot of what they preach, a lot of what they talk about, even at, when it pertains to the sport is like pace, sustain, uh, you know, don't go too hard, too often, this, that, and the other thing. And then you have other programs on the other side of the spectrum, which that's like, whether they say it explicitly or not is like, go throw up all the time, kill yourself. That's what the sport they is. They usually do say that. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, in my opinion, neither of those are correct. Right. Yeah. Like on this end, there is, you know, there's something like they said in terms of preparation, there's specific preparation, right. Specifically being prepared for a combination of clean and jerks and burpee bar facing burpees in an eight minute format done in your gym with not so many people around. Like, there's a lot of specific variables there, but there's also the gross variables of like just knowing what it feels like to be in a really crappy workout and push through anyways and like compete for points and like fight for every inch. Um, that's a skill as well. Um, and just like any skill, right? You have to practice that. Um, and I feel like the people who don't do that enough and that's like, a lot of times we'll do like the, the name game workout. So once a week, the goal is to really compete, right? Whether the workout dictates that or not might adjust the rest of the week, but the goal is every so often to do that. So you can find that, what that feels like. And so it's not foreign when you get into it on, on the floor, floor, right? So if you're on the, if you're on the floor and you're pushing, you're like, wow, I'm hurting super bad. I don't know what this is like. You're naturally going to pull off the gas. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, it's like you talked about Ben, like there's also a skill level to the sport. And so if you literally just spend the entire time ramming your head against the wall, you're never going to acquire the skills necessary to compete at a high level. And then also express that level of intensity through those skills. Um, and I, so I think part of the mental aspect is the willingness in training to every once in a while, take yourself to that point. Um, so that it's not a foreign concept to you and you don't hit the, you know, that feeling you talked about where it's like you, you're in pain a minute too. I know that feeling where you're, you're like, oh no. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to have to do this for another six minutes. <laughs> yeah, literally, literally the, the thought I have in my head when that happens is, oh no. Like, yeah. oh no. No, that's literally is. like what it is. I don't, <laughs> and like, <laughs> it was actually super <laughs> interesting. Uh, Kara brought this up. She's a ultra runner and I interviewed her. And uh, one of the things she said was like, if I feel really bad early on in the race, it gives me a, a ton of anxiety. And Stacey was like, well, what is it like? What do you do about that? And she's like, nothing. I'm just anxious. Like, it, it's not good. <laughs> and it's like, right. that's the same thing. It's like when, when you're in an eight minute workout and you're hurting really bad at minute two and you're like, oh, no, I'm like in a bad place already. Yes, you can let off the gas a little bit, but like. There's just nothing really you can do. Like, and that's why you no. get so much anxiety is because like you're forced to sit there for six minutes and figure out how to cope with the pain. Cause like, you're just yeah. trying to like manipulate your way through the workout without completely imploding. Yeah. Cause yeah. the only way you get out of pain at that point is stopping. Right. <laughs> it's like, Oh, came out too hot. I'm yeah. just going to stop. Right. Yeah, and you're not going to do that. <laughs> well, maybe. Yeah. Maybe in like a, a qualifier, you could just like shut it down. You're like, well, sure, I'm pacing way sure. too hot. But I think that takes a ton of uh, experience for the athletes part. And it's also like, you can't be doing that all the time. And if you're in an in-person comp, like, yeah, you don't have that option. Right. Yeah. I think that's a, a big thing too. I asked a few people this question. That was one thing they mentioned, like if they're in a competition, it's like when you come out too hot or you're just, you're, you feel like minute two, you're done. There's four minutes to go. It's like, 
what do you like there are people watching like you have friends and family there it's the worst feeling like you have nowhere to go nowhere to hide so uh, i i see that being thing. people saw like chris was mentioning uh, chris was mentioning like you have to at, occasionally like have it planned in your programs like go hard to dig deep at least like once a week that's how i view it not every day i have progressions and all that but there should be like one workout week where you're like testing that skill the dig deep where you can go and i think in a training perspective it's okay to time that session or that day around how you feel like if you feel real good freaking get after it right and if you feel like crap well then pull off right because it's training um but yeah, I think that's important to do. And then the other thing I talk, I personally talked about was how you frame some of that self-talk because I know a lot of people will err on the negative. Like, don't be so soft. I can't believe you're giving up, blah, blah, blah. But I, used, I, I would tell some of my athletes who were like nervous about a workout, like this is going to hurt really bad. It's like, yeah, and you signed up for that, right? <laughs> like, I feel like sometimes we lose sight of that where it's like, you know, you do believe it or not, have an option to not do this and you keep showing up. So, you know, kind of embrace the fact that you're in the business of finding your limits and be willing to find that. Yeah. To that point, I think like for me, speaking as a, uh, an athlete, it's like, the, and this is Riley mentioned this when I interviewed her, but it was like, uh, like, I, I do tell myself, like, man, this is going to be really painful. And, like, maybe I don't say that out loud, but, like, I have that thought. And it definitely is, like, something that I'm very conscious of because of my experience with those types of workouts. And then it's, like, but when I start, it's, like, all right, stay relaxed, find your pace. And that's, like, as long as I can possibly tolerate. Mm-hmm. And then it's, like, all right, here mm-hmm. we go sort of thing. Like, and from then on, it's all, like, it, it goes from, like, being, like, for, again, for me, if it's if it's a an L workout that has at least an element of pacing, it's like stay as relaxed as possible, and then that eventually changes from like that holding back kind of language to like here we go, like lean into it, like push, like that all those mm-hmm. types of like, I guess it'd just be positive self talk. Um, mm-hmm. I don't even really think about it that way. It's just like for me, it's like I'm 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 thinking about how to push myself, and mm-hmm. it's like uh, there the, also like one more thing that you mentioned that I thought was super interesting was like. Uh, like if you're, yeah, I mean, you can think about like having that like positive self-talk where like you're encouraging yourself and like competing against yourself. I often, if I'm by myself, will visualize fake opponents or even like real people right like, like, Oh, I, I know like, uh, Sam Hoggins done like th- this workout or he's doing it right now and I'm going to try to beat him or this or that. Right. I pick somebody that I know, or like, for example, I was getting ready for Metcon rush. I was like visualizing it in the lanes with other people around me who are pushing the paces in different ways. And like, I'm having to try to catch them and things. Mm-hmm. So visualization when it's like, it's only me or even like an online qualifier, I'll do that too. Like I'll envision like everybody and all the gyms doing this workout and I'm racing them at the same time and I'm trying to beat them all. And it's like, mm-hmm. that helps you pick up the bar two seconds faster and make up five places in an online qualifier. Cause that's what's required. So I think that does change when it's like a, uh, an in-person comp where it's like, if I'm literally side by side with somebody, I think Chris might allude to this earlier, but I was like, in that scenario, I'm so much more excited to hurt because especially in a workout that I'm confident in, like I know mm-hmm. that my capacity is really good and that I can push people because it means that if I'm hurting, that the people next to me are going to get buried. And it's like, you yeah. can only, you can only do that if you know you have like incredible capacity in something. But in that situation, like that's a really good feeling. A hundred percent. Yeah. And that's just like, that's also just being a competitor. Right. And there's the aspect of that where it's like, there are, there, there are people I know that, you know, maybe don't like that feeling or will get nose to nose in a competition like that and fade just because they, they're like, oh my gosh, I hurt so bad. And they're focused on that versus the person who is like, I'm going to, I'm going to run you down. Like, I'm like, you better get moving. Cause I'm coming like that, that those are like real thoughts that real people have. And the, and the competitor is the, the people who are good competitors are the ones who they they have that like second gear that maybe they 
occasionally get to in training, can't really get to, but because they're a competitor racing for points, it's like all of a sudden they're the type of person who always beats their practice times when they hit the competition floor, right? Because they have the person next to them, they're neck and neck, and they're just willing to dive that just a little bit deeper to try to, to beat that person. Yeah. So that, that makes me curious. Like, uh, so like Chris and I feel like are pretty similar in that way. Like, you know, like that, uh, racing like head to head mentality. And I don't know if that's just cause like we are like grew up in like, you know, contact sports and like, that's just like, was sort of like ingrained in like part of like the actual sport. Like Dade, do you like frame things like that at all? Or like, do you think about it a different way? I do. I just frame it to some extent, right? Where it's like, if I'm going to uh, a workout where I know there's a lot of my strength there, that's where I'll have that mentality where it's like, I'm going to hurt, but I know I'm hurting more because this is what I'm good at. I guess it's like exciting, right? When you know you're good at something, it's like kind of exciting to like show it off, just like do it. So there's that. But then if it's like, if it's the other end of the spectrum where I'm like, oh crap, like this has this movement where whatever, that's where I'll start looking for as just eating myself, like being previous times, previous weights, whatever it is, um, versus worrying about everyone else. Like they could do their own thing right now. It's, I'm focused on me because this is like, this is stuff that scares me. Like, right. I like, I'm not good here, here, here. I'm focusing on making sure I hit everything that I want to hit. And beating like beating my previous best, beating my strategy, doing all that, not worrying about what everyone else is doing, because that's gonna really get in my head. I feel like a lot of what we talked about was like that six to eight minute time domain where it's like really painful and like not super long, where you're just like you might be in your own head, but in a different way. But uh, let, like let's say it's like a you know ten k row for time time trial <laughs> like so like h- how do you like navigate that mentally Dip- may- maybe like contrast it from like how it would be different if it was like you know 2k row for time so for me you know you kind of talked about that and it made me think about there was an open workout from a couple of years ago and i might butcher all the specifics but maybe maybe you guys remember it was like a 20 minute AMRAP of like four dumbbell thrusters, like six or eight toes to bar and like 24 double unders. Right. And so long workout, short sets, lots of transitions. Um, and I vividly remember seeing that workout come out and being like, oh, crap. <laughs> and it wasn't, oh, crap, in the sense of like, oh, that's super long. It's just like, I looked at that and I was like, I know I'm going to be good at that workout and I know it's going to be hurting really bad. Um, and I think in those workouts, it's really, really important to have the mentality that you talked about, even in an eight minute workout where it's like smooth, under control, move with purpose. Um, because you can, in, in a, in a workout like that, you can dilly dally. And you don't know that you lost out on all this time until minute 15, right? And you're like, oh, crap. Like, I lost out on all these reps that I'm not going to get back in this five-minute window. Um, you could also come out too hot, right? And so, but I think the important thing is in a workout that's long, whether it be a CrossFit workout like that or the 10K example that you gave, where it's like, okay, the goal is to come out nice and smooth, nice and consistent at some point in probably the first, you know, on a 10 K row, uh, somewhere in the first third of the workout towards the end of that, I'm like, man, I'm already a little Bernie. Like I'm tired of being on this. My butt is kind of falling asleep, but it's this weird phenomenon. I feel like we're like, when you push past that barrier, there's like this middle section of like, you're just moving. Like things don't really hurt that bad. It doesn't get any worse. It doesn't get any better. Or like anyone who's run like a mile time trial, right? You kind of hit this point in the in the run where you're just like, man, this is starting to burn. I want to slow down. But like you really don't have to. And if you can hold that pace, there's this section in the middle where like the pain doesn't get any worse, right? And it might actually go down a little bit because your body and physiology starts to settle in until you hammer it at the end. 
Um, so I think it's really important in workouts like that to know the length of the workout, to know what's in front of you and to really kind of approach it in a, a, a calm, smooth, consistent state, and then know how to have the juice to kind of lay the hammer at the end. Okay. Yeah, I no, I, I agree with the uh, part where it's all. I, for me, I always feel like the first few minutes is where I'm like, um, it sucks, it sucks, blah, 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 I want to get off this. Start thinking about all the little things, like when ten the 10 minute bike test, where like the first few minutes, like, my shoulder hurts. Like, uh, why is it clicking? And I'm like, <laughs> so focused on that. And then I'm like, oh my God, like my heart rate just went up, blah, blah, blah. And then after minute six, you're just like, I got four minutes to go. Like, I feel good. So it's like, you always got to get over that. Um, I remember one time where I was doing like reverse hypers, just as many reps, like just continuous for four minutes. Oh, oh gosh. Four, <laughs> what are you, what are you, a nut? <laughs> what are you, a nut, Paul? <laughs> I can remember like the first 20 reps of the work, like after 20 to 30, but that's like, this is the and I still got like three more minutes, like three and a half more minutes. Um, but then after a while, it's just like you're just moving, right? You're just whistling at those legs and all that. And uh, it's just like you become numb, I guess. Um, so, ben, that yeah. reminds me of this time in a workout. I just had this guy take a baseball bat to my low back and glutes. It was four minutes of just repeated swinging. It, it was fine by the end of it, but I, I didn't even feel my legs the, the last three minutes. Yeah. Um, so I sat down to take a dump, didn't even feel it come out. <laughs> oh, uh, that is that's very true. Oh, so there's that. And then, like, I always think about like the military, right? You always have to take an annual test, and it includes a what, like, for the Air Force, the one and a half mile run that I absolutely hate running. Um, so that's one where. Honestly, one thing I do is I put the same song on repeat and just like go. I just put the same song on repeat. And I'm like, how many times could I like I try to get to as little number of repeats I can on that run? It's right. So it's like, all right. So last time I did this run, I the song played on repeat three and a half times. Let's try to get to three times, you know, or something like that. Something to keep me like focused on one thing. Um, so I'm not thinking about all these other things that I'd rather not about like running yeah yeah i feel like like a good part of something like that like especially if you, you like i think this is different when it's a cyclical movement like definitely like even that i think it was 20.2 that chris mentioned the 20 minute amrap i think that's uh a good example of like a a more or less cyclical crossfit workout like most yeah. athletes can make that where it's like they're just sort of moving through. They don't really have to think about forcing themselves to pick get to the next movement. They're just like kind of transitioning quickly and moving the whole time. And like that's sort of the same thing if you're on a 10-minute bike, if you're on a 30-minute row time trial or something like that. Um, where like you can like really easily kind of adjust your pace to like match where your work rate is supposed to be, so to speak. So like if I know I'm supposed to be rowing a – 10k time trial and i want to row at a 155 like i know i if i'm at 156 i'm over my pace or uh, under my pace and then if i'm at a 154 i'm i'm kind of where i want to be or if i'm 153 it's like oh i'm going too fast now i got to kind of relax so it's like that kind of trying to stay as relaxed as you can while doing that and then sort of like distracting yourself from the pain at least for me in a really long workout like that it's like and for me i feel like i do like a lot of math like i'll like and it's not and the thing is the reason I do that is because I'm so bad at it. I, I keep going. <laughs> it's like I'll it I'll like try while. to figure out my 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 split paces, and I'm like, okay, so this means that I'm like, if this is my pace, and I would Back. go two seconds faster Back. for four minutes, but what would that mean that I'm at now? It's like it takes me like three minutes to figure out what that would be, and then it's like, okay, now I have this much. I'm like, okay, my 44 percent of the workout done. It's like I just keep doing that kind of random stuff until I'm like 80 percent of the workout, and then I'm like, all right, now I can start to go. And it's like, so I, just I'm just like distracting. Row. I was about to say, you just do the row in a constant state of confusion. It sounds like, like you're <laughs> yeah, just I'm, disoriented the entire time. And, you just and I'm like trying to like reassure you. myself that I'm like, I am doing the right thing. But at the same time, it's like, <laughs> I'm so bad at the math that it takes me the whole time to get it done. Yeah. So that doesn't work for everybody. Yourself. But if you're not good at math, when you're at a high heart rate, it might work. <laughs>
I, I think also like you like with just monocyclical stuff like funnel structural like it's easier because you know you're here right so you could like adjust like you were saying so after if you're if you're used to going on those um, on the herbs or whatever then like you know where you should be at you're not guessing where like if it's a lot of movements um then sometimes like it's very easy to get caught up looking at the clock overthinking it wondering if you should do one faster than the other um but i think one good example is we did the the review of sam doing the strict muscle ups and hand push ups um, not neat the main game where he was very like the long time to be very like methodical in his movements you felt that he was like aiming for a time for each round and he kept that the whole time and then eventually the he piled up towards the end where you can see he was getting tired but he's still able to maintain it because he got like dreaded approaching it yeah no i mean that's a great example it's like um i think it's uh mike fitzgerald um anyway uh optimal performance training and they, they have a podcast and i think he mentioned on there that it was like if you pace a 2k row correctly it's like you hold the same pace basically the entire time and the end you're sprinting, but you can't really go any faster and you just sort of like keep the same pace throughout the workout and you're completely spent by the end. But like yeah. your pace didn't really change the whole time. And that's like sort of like what you're saying is like, if you pace things perfectly, it would be like you're experiencing like maximal pain as your performance potential is like just emptying the tank just as you like finish the, the like cross the mm -hmm. finish line. Um, which obviously, like, you're never going to know, but you can at least conceptually think about that and, like, trying to figure out how to pace things correctly. All right, last question for you guys. Um, where, Like, if, if you were a – you are a coach, so we don't have to be hypothetical. <laughs> <laughs> you just happen to be a super good coach. If you happen to be a super great coach. Uh, but, yeah, like, you guys are coaches, so, like, you got athletes and they're trying to get their – their best like they're trying to they get every drop out of this out of the squeeze um like what would you tell them like what what do you think a good way to mentally approach and like frame and contextualize metabolic pain is yeah. i i think for me the first thing I, I want to know is when we get into a workout that has a high level of metabolic pain, if there's performance drop off or low performance, is it, is it actually physical? Like you're, you're just not in great shape right now, or is it, or, or how much of it is it, how much of it is mental? And I think a lot of that is done through test and retest and then, uh, and then also watching the athlete perform the workout. Um, but let's assume for a second that it is a mental aspect. I think having the conversation of, of why, right? Um, like for like just looking at us, like Day said, you know, for her, she's probably in Day. You could correct me if I'm wrong. She's probably going to be able to hammer it way harder in a workout where she's confident in the movements. She's practiced the design, and it's not her first time attempting a workout, right? And so if we get into the competition floor. And there's some anxiety around that as a coach, I think drawing to the attention to we've been here before you've done these movements, you've done them, but basically continuing to pull that athlete into a sense of familiarity is going to allow them to have the confidence needed to push in that workout. Right. Um, versus another athlete who maybe just the, um, the, the physical sensation is a fearful thing. Um, and then maybe having the conversation of, you know, the positive benefits of, you know, gaining the points or finding their boundaries or just being blunt with like, well, you signed up for this sport, so you might as well just kind of push yourself to the limit here. Um, I think finding the, the why behind the anxiety would then help gear the conversation on how to frame uh, the pain there. Yeah, I think, um. A lot of times people have that block like lifting or if they get they kind of hesitate going into um the pain cave um i think getting familiar with whatever it is that stop block 
So mm. someone is, one thing I've noticed is like when I introduce like bike intervals with athletes, it's like the first week they're really good at it because they don't know, they don't have a concept of that game, <laughs> right? So they're getting like, there was like getting 25 calories in like 25, 20 to 25 seconds. Like they're, the bike looks like it's going to break. It looks like, I'm like, all right, sweet. The second week it's like 15 calories. And it's going down. All right, they're not into this. You can tell they're trying to pace it, or they're trying to like they're kind of out. They know how it feels, like pump the brake a little bit. So it's kind of like getting them familiar with that a little bit more and setting goals. It's like, okay, I know you're not going to get back to where you were the first week because you're like scared right now. Let's set this goal. Let's and then increase that goal. And you see it too with like Olympic lifting, where like after a certain weight, they can't seem to get under the bar. So it's kind of, all right, we're just going to hammer this, this movement down, something that you're comfortable, familiar with, and then we'll start from once you're comfortable there, increase incrementally. And everyone's incremental increase depends on how, like, how well they respond to the You can need smaller changes, some people can handle a little bit more. Um, if there's a, a workout that's really like, that's going to be pretty grindy, and I know um, this person is good, at all the movements, it's more of a, okay, you're, this is going to suck. This is strategy. I don't want you deviating from strategy. So this is like the lower limit. This is that you do meet at. Okay. And then from there, you can go up if you'd like. Um, but having like that strategy, it's not like it's going to suck, but this is like plan. So, so um, it really depends on the person and all that. But I think if someone's just like scared of getting into it, that's where you know, repetition, 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 slowly increasing all that. If someone's good at everything and they've been there before, they know it's going to suck. It's like, all right, you've been here before. This sucks. You know it. This is the plan. We're going to go with that. Yeah. I think it's interesting because it's like, to me, I feel like this conversation is – in my mind, I feel like a lot of what we talked about was the competitors because that's who, who largely we coach. And it's like, uh, for me, if it's somebody who's an athlete and they're competing and they're racing, it's like just giving them consistent exposures to all the stuff that they need to be really good at creates so much buy-in on their part that they're basically willing to run through a wall to get the rest score. And, it and it's like, I, I don't think there's any shortcut to that. Like, I think if you don't, put in a ton of time and a ton of reps and dedicate a bunch of stuff and say a whole bunch of like no to a whole bunch of other things outside of, of your sport to make sure that you're as sharp as possible to be good at this one thing. Then it's like, it becomes way easier to just dig really deep when you get there. Like mm -hmm. you're, you're just like willing to go to a very dark place because it's like, I spent the last six years of my life not drinking any alcohol, choosing not to go out on Friday nights, training twice a day. And I've done all that with the goal to be, you know, qualifying for this event, placing as high as I can in this event. And it's like, like you maybe don't even think about that consciously, but it's like when you start rowing and it's like, okay, this starts starting to get really painful. It's like you have this huge mental bank of like, all these experiences that are coming along with you. And not only does that provide you with like the physiology that you need to be able to express really high power output across all the stuff in CrossFit, but it's like that also allows you to be confident and like willing to dig deep enough where then you're able to actually go up against your capacity. Thanks for listening today. If you're someone who just started listening to the show, I would encourage you to subscribe so you can stay up to date. If you're someone who's been listening for a while, I would encourage you to rate and review the show. And lastly, the best thing that you can do to support our work is also the best thing that you can do for your performance. And that is by hiring one of our coaches. Until next time, stay the course.